2021 Speaker Series. Um, <laughs> I'm Juliet Johnson. I'm a professor of political science at McGill and a member of the center. And I'm moderating our speaker series this term, which has the theme, as many of you know, who have been at our previous talks of Europe and memory. So we're gonna start with our speaker presentation and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience just to let you know, and you've seen the, you've, you've seen the thing flashes before your eyes. The talk will, itself will be recorded, but not the Q&A. And when we get to the Q&A, please just use the raise hand function to indicate that you want to ask a question and I'll <laughs> moderate. And we'll end promptly at 10.25 a.m. So today I'm really pleased to welcome Anna Milosevic, a postdoctoral researcher at the Leuven Institute of Criminology at KU Leuven Faculty of Law. She's among many other things, the co-editor of the recent book, Europeanization and Memory Politics in the Western Balkans. And she's published widely on memory politics in Croatia and Serbia. Her current research examines post-terrorist memorialization in Europe to critically examine its effectiveness for the victims, their families and survivors. And on that very topic, today she'll be speaking about her brand new paper, Unshared European Memory, Remembering mm -hmm. Victims of Terrorism. So it, it's great to have you with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Juliet. And thank you for invite, inviting me to, to speak in this amazing series on a topic that is really close to my heart, uh, European memory politics. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, I hope it's a nice morning uh, wherever you are. So uh, uh, we are going to talk about terrorism today. It's usually not a, not a topic that you discuss over morning coffee, but I'm going to try to be quite light about it. And hopefully you will have uh, questions that we can um, address uh, after my talk. So uh, how I want to start with this presentation or talk is that um, I want to try to walk you down memory lane. So I want you to walk the memory lane with me. And I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> and this story has two main characters. So the first character uh, is Pascal. He's um, an employed guy from Belgium who lives in Amour. He, uh, he's married, he has children. And he also has a dog that is called Lassie. I know that's not quite original. And the, the second uh, character of this story is myself. And uh, as uh, Juliette said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher. I deal with memory. Some people are, refer to me as a monument hunter and whatever not. So we have Pascal and we have myself, got it. So now imagine that we are um, in Brussels, in Belgium. It's a grayish morning, like every other morning, probably in Brussels. And, you know, I'm leaving my kid in the kindergarten and, you know, I park badly and my hair is a mess. And now I have to go and pick up my friend at the airport. And I'm just like driving towards the airport and there's this, you know, earworm song on the radio. And I'm just like thinking about so many things. And in that particular moment, Pascal, who I didn't know at that time, was already at the airport. And Pascal was with his wife. And they were quite chirpy because they were planning this solo trip to New York after so many years since their honeymoon. So they're going back without kids and they're you know, having, having a blast. They're they are happy because they're about to travel to New York. And at the moment when they were checking in with Air France, bombs exploded. So what happened next was that there was silence, there was dust, and you know there was a lot of pain. So when events like unexpected, unexpected events like this happen, uh, the feeling that we have is the one of holding a breath uh, underwater. So the time, in a certain sense, uh, stands still as some of the, the victims I interviewed told me. So we are worried, we don't know what is happening. We are afraid for our security, for our loved ones. We might need help. We might need assistance when we might need support. And Pascal told me this quite vivid story of what happened to him at the Zaventem airport in 2016 during the, the Brussels attacks maybe approximately one year um, after the attacks when we met to discuss what were the earliest stages of you know, the book I'm actually um, at this moment writing about uh, the topic. 
So both Pascal and I, we still have this kind of quite vivid memories of the event of the Brussels attacks. And these um, memories are uh, referred in the literature as the flashbulb memories. And Pascal, of course, he was a direct victim um, uh, of the terrorist attacks in Brussels. And me, in a certain sense, I was an indirect victim of the Brussels attacks because as a resident of Brussels, I was also touched by, by these, uh, these events. And I was also someone who ever since uh, tried to scientifically, let's say, give an explanation or maybe um, explain what it does actually mean to remember the victims uh, of terrorism. So why I'm saying this story about, about Pascal, about myself, because um, I want to emphasize that memories are first and the foremost personal experiences. And these memories only secondly, they become knowledge. They become knowledge um, as we learn about the past and maybe learn about experiences, persons and events that we, do not, we did not experience personally. So in this case, it is in this case that we can speak of collective memory. We can speak about collective remembering whereby you know, we are a sort of a time travel. So we go to the past, we visit the past, and we kind of, you know, bring with our, ourselves certain um, ideas uh, about the past. We, we kind of retrieve ideas, we retrieve values and thoughts that are associated with the past that will, in a certain sense, help us understand who we are and where maybe we are heading and who we are is a really complex universe of you know, cross-sectional identities, whether these identities are political, they are religious, they are sexual, they are maybe ethnic kind of ident identities. And um, as previous lectures in this series um, have probably mentioned, collective memory, and I mean that knowledge that we have of the past has been the cornerstone of modern nation states. And mass scale um, events such as Holocaust or maybe the Second World War, and, or even if we think about you know, the death toll of the current COVID pa pandemic, you know, these kind of events, they are largely felt experiences that have shaped in a certain sense our um, personal and also collective existence. So to a certain extent, memory is both an experience, whether it is direct or indirect as well knowledge about the past. And this collective memory can be also prioritized and it has also a certain kind of hierarchy because first and the foremost memory is personal experience and then it can be collective. It can be an experience that we experience as a group, as I said, religious, ethnic, sexual, political. So what this has to do actually with transnational memory. So how can we go about transnational memory and how can we go about European memory in general? Um, is there a European memory that we can actually talk about? So my answer to this question is maybe surprising, but um, I don't think there is uh, a European memory. I think that there is no such a thing uh, as clearly distinct EU memory. We can talk about EU memory actors. We can talk about the mechanisms of Europeanization of memory. Um, we can talk about how the politics actually uses um, uh, these mechanisms and how the actors actually use these mechanisms to jointly select and derive meanings from different personal and nation state um, experiences. And we can also talk about the ways in which the EU memory politics um, and its actors assign purposes to collective remembering because remembering in itself, it is also defined by the purpose we, we assign to it. So collective remembering at the EU level is selective memory politics for me with clear, clear, clear objectives. So maybe to walk you through um, the relationship between the EU and the past, I'm gonna um, maybe mention two, I, I think main episodes in the history of the European Union. So of course we have the, we have the, the birth of the European Union after the second world war. 
which is uh, the, let's say, the reasoning behind the creation of, of the European Union. So what we had in those times after the Second World War, it was pretty much related to the rejection uh, of the past. The rejection of the past, rejection of uh, violence, and, you know, like paving a certain, you know, new way to the future, the joint future in peace uh, and prosperity. So this was the, 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 the original idea behind the European Union. So therefore, the main purpose that was assigned to the past at the time was the one of a promise of uh, non-repetition on non-reoccurrence so that these crimes and these atrocities never, never, ever happen again. So that is why we have never again. But in a, also in a certain sense, you know, rejection of the past and these promises of non-reoccurrence that also supported the legitimization uh, objectives of the European Union um, at that time. So what happened next, uh, after the, 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 the end of the Cold War, we had the EU enlargements, uh, various vagues of EU enlargement, especially to the Eastern, Eastern Europe. And this widening and deepening of the European Union brought the need to uh, sort of engage with the question of European identity and to help in a certain way citizens identify more with the, with the European Union. So it is in this period um, with um, enlargement to the Central and Eastern European countries, the Baltic states, that we have seen the most intensive engagement um, of the European Union with the past. And I have referred to this um, in one of my, my papers and in other works as the, the, the crucial moment for the emergence of the EU memory framework. So what actually is the EU memory framework? So this is a product of intense um, engineering um, on EU level, dealing with engaging with the questions of memory. And it resulted in a series of soft laws and policies that are pursued by the European Parliament and the European Commission, and to a certain extent by the, the European Council. And these um, EU memory framework actually seeks to um, convey uh, what are the minimum common denominators that we have on the past, because the European member states, they have different past, but they have to agree on something and that something are the minimum common denominators. So what are the minimum common denominators <laughs> is another question. So it is a politically uh, reached consensus on what the past was in the Eastern Europe and Western Europe and what are the common ideas, values and meanings that are jointly shared. So this brings me back to terrorism, which is the main topic of our, 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 our session today. And, you know, terrorism, you know, it's, it is not a novel phenomenon in Europe, but it's not a memory that is shared by all member states. So not all member states have had this experience with terrorist attacks, whether in present day times or in the past. Some of the, the countries, uh, of course, they, they, they had this kind of experiences. Uh, country, countries such as um, Italy, uh, Spain, UK, uh, Ireland, uh, Belgium as well in the 70s and the 80s. But these terrorist attacks, they had different kind of um, ideological background and they, they were um, quite different and quite, um, you know, um, uh, locally, let's say, uh, grounded. But what happened with terrorism on the EU level, when terrorism on EU level became something to engage with. So the EU engagement actually with terrorism and remembrance in particular came only after the attacks in Madrid in 2004, when uh, Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility for murdering uh, thousands and hundreds and hundreds of people actually in, in Madrid in the uh, Toja metro, uh, metro station. So um, it is in that particular moment that the EU uh, have taken the role of being active memory actor in actually using uh, remembrance. And how did the EU at that time use remembrance? Well, first of all, they created a, a resolution in the European Parliament uh, trying to um, condemn the violence and provide um, uh, solidarity uh, for the victims, express their solidarity for the victims. But 
in if we look at the whole uh, policy that relates to terrorism and ways in which the EU uses remembers in relation to terrorism, we can see that anti-terrorism as a part of the EU security um, agenda, you know, positions quite high, you know, on the on the list of priorities, and. Um, the novelty is that this anti anti terrorist agenda uh, in, back in 2005 was actually used in remembrance as a tool to deal with anti radicalization, okay, and to respond to restorative justice needs um, of the victims. So, how terrorism fits the EU memory politics? So, as I said, on the one hand, we have this resolution um, on remembrance of terrorist attacks that was made by the parliament and that was uh, adopted just um, in a few days uh, after the attacks. So we have members of the European parliament that have uploaded these events into transnational sphere. So what was the rationale for the adoption of such a remembrance day? And we are talking about the EU day of remembrance for the victims of terrorism seen as a transnational event, not only related to the attacks in Madrid. So they wanted to strengthen the position of the European Union as a protector um, of citizens uh, on the one hand, and to remember the, the victims through a resolution meant actually that annual day of remembrance will be observed in memory of the victims so they, that they are not forgotten. And of course, um, you know, like terrorist attacks and especially recent terrorist attacks in Europe were above all um, attacks on, you know, member states, not on the European Union. Although if we look at the, the, the governmental responses, especially after the Brussels attacks, you will find that, that um, a number of politician uh, presidents of, um, of European uh, member states um, they were actually arguing that, you know, the attack on Brussels was not only the attack on the city and on the country itself, but it was an attack, direct attack um, on Europe. But what I argued in my paper and, um, and how I'm, I'm, I'm seeing these, um, these events on national level is actually that, um, you know, quite fits with the general definition of, of terrorism in which, you know, the perpetrators, um, they use citizens as tools as a sort of a vehicles to disseminate terror and inflict harm to the state, not to the victims itself. So the state is their main target. In this sense, victims of terrorism are always seen as innocent. You know, they are um, seen as, you know, random sample of a population to whom a harm is done to further perpetrators uh, agenda. And this is, I think, I find it's quite interesting, you know, this distinction I'd say as, you know, like different acts of violence, such as genocide, for instance, you know, they define and understand victimhood in a very different way than when we speak about terrorism, you know, because we always assume that victims, whatever, you know, the perpetrators are, whatever there was uh, ideology behind it, we assume that the victims are innocent. And you know, all victims are innocent, and the reasons for them being actually um, a, a victim, you know, and target of such violence, can di diverge in a number of ways. And you know, the reasons why the, this harm was afflicted upon them. So some vic victims are targeted because of their beliefs; other are targeted because of their identities. It goes on and on, and and of course, this is not the case with with terrorism. You know, from what modern days, um, at least, because the the terrorists and the perpetrators of terrorist attacks, they do not necessarily, let's say, discriminate on the basis of you know these characteristics. So um, when when Pascal and I met in two thousand and seventeen, I'm going back to Pascal. We were meeting just, you know, a couple of days after, you know, the first commemoration uh, for the Brussels attacks uh, was uh, was organized. And we were, I remember we were sitting in this small brasserie in Amour and, you know, I was interviewing him and I wanted really to, you know, better understand, um, you know, what were his feelings, what were his thoughts about his, you know, personal experience, but also, you know, the impressions he had about this, you know, official commemoration that, took place just a couple of days ago and it was organized uh, by the state. 
And I think, you know, here we are arrived to, I think, a quite also important distinction uh, between what is a national and what is transnational dimension to, to remembrance. So this locally grounded event, such as the Brussels attacks, uh, you know, is above all owned by, by a member state. It is owned by a nation state to the place where, where it actually happened. And, you know, the state usually uses um, this first anniversary to kind of, you know, frame the, the event, to explain to the large population what had happened, how it happened, who were the perpetrators, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this commemoration is a sort of, you know, like a template uh, of, you know, how this event will be remembered um, in, the in the future and how it will be, let's say, encoded in, in collective consciousness. What I want to emphasize here and, you know, um, is the role that the victims actually have in, in this process, because, because I'm of belief that the, the victims are not central to this process, not because they um, need not to be central, but because they are seen as, a, you know, as a secondary um, actor in this process. Uh, they are sometimes, of course, um, involved uh, in the process of commemoration, but, you know, that was um, also the issue after the 9-11 in New York, um, that a lot of uh, victims, uh, survivors, family members of the people who have died in the attacks, they were not part of the, you know, larger process on, you know, negotiating the meanings um, and ideas about memorialization. So on the one hand, we have, you know, like, um, this uh, role of the victims in commemoration that is actually quite testimonial. So it is reduced to being just the testimonies, the barriers of you know these personal experiences for the larger for the larger public. And the issue with that, what is the issue with that? The issue is that you know state itself, I think. <laughs> rises to the to the level of primary victim so this means that you know like actual victims people who have experienced this actual violence they are absorbed kind of into this you know overall framing framing of the event and the victims and the state in a certain sense become one so there is this issue, you know, about representation of victims and, you know, like hearing their voices actually in the memorialization process. And I think it's an important um, issue, an important uh, question. So on the transnational um, EU level, with this uh, resolution that we had in the European Parliament, uh, this issue became problematized only with the multiplication of organizations that deal with victims' rights. So the organizations that actually represent the victims, um, they are quite a topic as well, <laughs> quite, quite interesting, because uh, what you need to remember about these organizations is uh, it's quite simple. They you know, usually emerge um, in the immediate aftermath of a certain, certain event. So they emerge quite quickly and also they die out uh, quite quickly for, for a number of reasons that I cannot uh, explain today in this talk. But um, as Julian said, there is this uh, forthcoming paper that I wrote with uh, Jerome Truc uh, on this topic that it will become part of this special issue um, I've co-edited with Philippe Perchoc in it will, it will appear in the um, Politique Européenne quite, quite soon. So uh, what interests us here in relation to the EU remembrance and in relation to the victims is, you know, how these victims are represented on transnational level. And on transnational level, um, I can share my experience um, as being member of the Radicalization Awareness Network, which is a network um, organized by the European Commission and in co collaboration with the European Council. So over the fa uh, past five years, um, I have been um, co-organizing that famous EU Day of Remembers for the Victims. And I can maybe say a few words about that because um, as an insider, I have a, a quite um, 
let's say, um, interesting, interesting view uh, on the topic. So because this provided me really with a unique um, opportunity, not only to, uh, you know, like be involved in the process and actually have a say um, about how the, the EU Remembrance Day will be organized, but it also put me in contact with a number of victims associations and with victims themselves. And um, these uh, victims and victims associations do not necessarily come uh, only from Europe because we also uh, engage with people who are hurt uh, or killed um, in attacks that happened uh, outside the Europe. So uh, part of this network, as I said, are the victims associations and they come largely from Germany, France, uh, Belgium, Spain, to some extent from Portugal, maybe, um, Italy, <clears throat> and sporadically maybe from, uh, from other countries. And, you know, what these countries have in common, what are the, the, the most, wh wh why they are uh, most represented in this network? Uh, well, the question, you know, the answer is quite uh, straightforward, I would say, because they have all suffered a number of, you know, terrorist attacks, especially recently. And this means that they effectively have shared past. They have similar experiences, better said. And in terms of, you know, dealing uh, with uh, victims' rights, uh, such as, for instance, compensation, right to compensation, they also have similar issues. So for the RAN, uh, I think for the, uh, this network I belong to, um, I think the most important challenge over the years has been to make this event truly transnational. Because if you have member states that come from a certain number of countries and you work only with them, you know, it becomes a matter only of the you know, people who effectively had these kind of um, experiences. And you know, how this justifies then um, having the EU Day of Remembrance, whether, you know, this, if this event is not shared, it's not a shared experience, it's not a shared memory that, you know, people throughout Europe can identify with. And this is, uh, I think, quite um, interesting because the, um, the EU, you know, like how then to explain why the EU has such a, su such a date? Um, that is called, you know, the Transnational Day, European Day of Remembrance. Because the EU um, has been using remembrance over the years for a number of, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, clear political objectives. And th the EU engages in this kind of symbolic acts of, you know, condemnation. Uh, but to become truly transnational, you know, what what needed to change actually with this um, day of remembrance, <clears throat> and um, the issue at stake was actually um, that we realized that uh, most of the you know uh, the the events that were we were tackling in this uh, network um, actually considered single states, a single uh, a limited number of uh, member states. And we realized that it's quite, you know, like difficult to provide some kind of, you know, transnational narrative that, you know, people across Europe can actually um, identify with. And this is also due to the fact that, the, you know, the nation states, the member states of the European Union, they still have this, you know, monopoly over interpretation of such violence that cannot be disputed by the EU. So what this means, that the EU, um, largely operates with remembrance practices and ceremonies that, you know, seek to provide a sort of, you know, acknowledgement, recognition of past injustices, um, you know, traumatic experiences. But, you know, while this might be the case maybe with past um, experiences, such as the instance uh, victims of, you know, totalitarian regimes, uh, victims of terrorism um, with victims of terrorism, we see a different kind of pattern because the, the remembrance of terrorist attacks in Europe is directly directed towards this anti-radicalization policies. It, it is supportive you know, of anti-terrorism agenda um, on EU level. And these uh, victims, associ uh, victims associations, they kind of, you know, like they're uh, used as a sort of a vessels um, uh, uh, for that purpose. 
So there are, as I said, a number of participating victims um, organizations that, you know, seek to, you know, like pursue this kind of transnational dimension of the Day of Remembrance. But for them also, you know, it's a, it's a game that it's a win-win situation uh, also for them. They also uh, gain benefits from being present on the EU level. What this means? This means that, you know, they gain a certain kind of professional professionalization they are receiving maybe funds uh, from the from the from the EU or other uh, forms of you know support as well that kind of legitimize them um, on a national level uh, but it also it kind of amplifies their voice you know adding strength strengthens uh, their say on national level which is their primarily focus so they are not concerned with dealing on terrorism as much on transnational European level, because for them, what really counts is, you know, what happens on the ground, what happens in the countries uh, they, they come from. And I think the two things need to be mentioned here. They need to be really emphasized uh, because who is not familiar with this topic and has not worked uh, a lot, you know, directly with, uh, with these organizations and the victims themselves need to be aware that not all the victims participate in this kind of, you know, collective gathering around uh, associations. So not all the victims are members of victims associations. Uh, for instance, I have a, a student now in my, my course in Leuven, who was uh, one of the, the victims of the terrorist attacks in Brussels. And he, she's, uh, for instance, quite critical about the work of, of these associations and she doesn't uh, feel that these associations represent her ideas and what she actually wants in terms of uh, compensation and uh, you know defending of her right um, rights uh, as the victim and the second idea that the second thing that I, I wish to emphasize and I think it's quite important that the victims associations at the EU level, they only have limited say in, you know, managing uh, and deciding about the EU Day um, of Remembrance. So this means that, you know, those who are really in control and those who really make this, you know, organize this event are the European Commission, uh, first of all, and then, of course, the Council, uh, there are the voices of the member states uh, themselves. So they work towards, you know, supporting what are, you know, politically agreed, let's say, on EU level, objectives that are assigned to memorialization, that are assigned to remembrance in the relation to, to, um, to terrorists. So this means as well that, you know, if we are going to organize an EU Day of Remembrance, uh, you know, it, it is uh, important as well uh, for the victims uh, associations to be present there, because as I said, they, they gain a number of, you know, like uh, advantages um, if they are participating uh, in, this, uh, in this process. But some of them, especially the organizations that have a high number of people who are um, members of the association, they kind of act as gatekeepers. Uh, and it is really, really hard for new organizations that emerge actually to have their, you know, the say on transnational European level or just simply to be heard because if they are, have alternative voices or are critical um, about the use of remembrance on EU level, they will simply have no, uh, have no voice in, in, in the process. So what I, um, I think I wanna say with this is that remembrance is in no ways immune to uh, politicization. And as such, you know, collective memory is, um, always a dimension of, you know, of power, of political power. And this, I think, became quite clear um, a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, when the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, decided to make his own commemoration uh, for the victims um, of terrorism. So what he said actually was, yes, we're going to have a national day of commemoration for the victims of terrorism. And this is understandable, you know, because 
France had um, uh, the major number of terrorist attacks. You could think, you know, back there was the, the attack on Charlie Hebdo, then there was a, a, a kosher supermarket attack, and there was an attack in Nice, et cetera, et cetera, um, at the stadium. So, you know, it was, I think, kind of, you know, expected that the France would do something in terms of remembers for, you know, such a huge number um, of victims. But what he actually did um, is that he said like, yeah, we're gonna make a National Day of Remembrance, but we're gonna make it on the 11th of March, which is the European Day of Remembrance. And I remember back then when we got this communication uh, well in advance um, uh, within the group in, in European Commission, we were quite puzzled because we didn't, understand like why would France make a national day of remembrance on the date of the attacks in Spain? So that was uh, quite confusing. And I think it was quite confusing also for the citizens and especially people in Paris when the commemoration was actually organized on, on the 11th of March, uh, two years ago for the first time, because they could not understand, you know, like it is a European commemoration or is it a French national day of remembrance? And also, you know, people, the victims association that were present there, um, they were also, you know, really puzzled uh, about, you know, how this process is going to go. You know, in the morning, we went to the UNESCO building in Paris um, and we had this, you know, small kind of uh, gathering to commemorate. And I, I, I want to emphasize that it was in the middle of a COVID pandemic as well. So, um, and then we were rushed to the uh, Place Trocadero in Paris, where you have this beautiful view of, you know, Eiffel Tower, and there was this, you know, like flags and military and really pompous um, kind of celebration. And there was also a Spanish king there. So there was a French president and there was also a Spanish king. And of course, you know, like people are, were really genuinely puzzled about, you know, what this day has to do actually with France and why the Spanish king is there. And, you know, the victims and the victims association that came from other countries, such as, for instance, you know, from, from Germany, who also had um, a number of terrorist attacks, they were saying, yes, you know, like France now, you know, like it, it kind of like um, created this kind of hierarchy uh, between the victims of, of terrorist attacks in Europe because they are now treated as special victims because now they have a special national day, which is not the case with Germany, which is not the case with Belgium, where we have just the annual commemoration of the attacks that happened um, on our soil. And I think that the, the whole um, mess with separating the European dimension and the national dimension is going to get even more complicated this year, this 11th of March, because the, the commemoration is organized in Madrid. And of course, because the Spain now also um, wishes to celebrate, uh, to commemorate, let's say, its own experiences uh, of uh, terrorist attacks. So, um, to go back maybe and finish wrap up, uh, about the uh, EU memory framework and the, the place of terrorism in European memory politics. Um, I am not sure that the transnational and national can always um, coexist, but the EU memory framework and the, you know, within it, the day of remembrance for the victims of terrorism are you know, symbolically forged uh, views uh, on the past. And the question, I think the big question here um, uh, that kind of like proposes itself is, you know, whether we are actually talking about remembrance, if we put the remembrance solely in the service of, you know, prevention policies, politics, um, radicalization policies, anti-terrorism agenda, is it really, is it really remembers we are talking about or whether that is just simply and plainly, you know, the political use um, uh, of the past. And um, what emerged uh, from my uh, research on this topic over uh, last years, and I have worked on the Brussels case, I have worked on the Paris case, uh, Norway, uh, Barcelona, and several others, is that I believe that, you know, member states, they hold tightly to you know, their national past. And above all, I think they're not ready to, you know, dilute these kind of meanings that are assigned to the past. And, and the meanings they also they project 
um, onto the past because they, they want to keep that monopoly. Uh, and of course, what this case uh, also shows is that EU memory politics and the EU, EU itself are, you know, used as a political uh, opportunity structure to which a wide range of objectives um, can, be, can be projected. It can be used and it can be abused, of course. And perhaps this is um, uh, the most important lesson of my recent, re recent research on this topic that, you know, like we should not always naively assume that remembrance has solely this kind of beneficial effect. And the, the so-called right to memory can, you know, like not always can cure the aches uh, from the past and the victims of terrorism, they know this quite well, I would say. Because uh, when, you know, this commemorative, commemorative circus that, you know, like happens once per year, when, when this is, you know, finished, they are left, you know, with years, you know, long legal battles to obtain their, their legal rights, to obtain some kind of compensation for their experiences, to pay medical bills, you know, the people lose their jobs, they, you know, Families are torn apart because these are um, uh, really life-changing experiences. And, you know, some of the victims, they, you know, they drown in, uh, in drugs, they drown in alcohol. People have different kind of reactions to what had happened to them. And what they believe, I think, uh, more, if I can, if I can say like, like that, make some kind of generalization, what they believe um, in terms of, you know, like a remembrance is that, Remembrance as a sort of like a public, at, at the public level, is just, you know, a quick patch and fix to solution for, you know, more pressing issues that it actually uh, are dealing with. And when their rights are uh, unattended and, you know, they feel that their uh, memories are being, you know, abducted in a certain way, hijacked or abused, you know, appropriated um, by, by the state or even by the, by the European Union. Uh, probably I should say by the collective because uh, we are talking in, in those terms. Instead, um, each personal experience, I believe, is you know quite uh, different and, and quite unique. And those personal experiences, you know, personal memories that 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 we have of those events, whether we participated directly or indirectly, I think that those kind of you know experiences just you know stick with you, and those kind of memories are are there uh, there forever. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop here because <laughs> otherwise, yeah, there's so many interesting uh, things that I could mention about this, but I would not, I do not wish to dilute uh, further um, my talk about this topic. Yeah, great, thank you very much, Anna. It's very interesting. 